All right, so you can see me okay? Yep. All right, everybody, uh, good morning. Those of you online, I think we have 36 uh, people from, I guess, Dallas, Baylor, maybe around the state of Texas, hopefully around other places. So uh, interesting times we're in right now. We thought we would uh, use this opportunity to, to give you guys a little bit of uh, online education. And um, if you would, maybe keep your uh, microphones muted so we don't get a lot of feedback. Uh, if anybody's calling in by telephone, uh, mute your phone. And then uh, at the end of the session, we'll either open it up for some live questions or we'll have, uh, and there is a chat box, you can type in your questions on chat and I'll answer them at the end of the day. So uh, I thought today, given that we're dealing with a worldwide pandemic of an infection, we might talk about uh, our role as dermatologists and dermatopathologists and how we can diagnose infectious diseases. Um, let's see, not uh, too many cutaneous manifestations of the COVID-19, although there actually has been a couple of case reports uh, of, a, of a mild sort of uh, morbilliform eruption. So uh, we might see that somewhere. If you guys wouldn't mind muting in the background because I'm hearing some feedback, if you would, please. So uh, how do we diagnose infectious disease under the microscope? Well, there are a lot of different ways. You can see the organisms, uh, special stains, uh, cases where we Something, something is there, don't see it on routine staining. We can do things like DNA probes or PCR uh, and then electron microscopy. So I'm gonna kind of go through a number of different examples of that uh, in the lecture this morning. So what we're gonna do is kind of look at uh, some viral exam, viral processes, uh, bacterial processes, fungal processes, and then some uh, ectoparasites. So let's start off looking at herpes virus infection. You all know a little bit about this already, hopefully. Uh, if you look at it under the microscope, you get a classic, uh, what we call margination of the chromatin of the infected keratinocytes. Uh, they get kind of a gunmetal gray color to them. And then you get the multinucleated epithelial giant cells. Uh, they may be numerous when you're doing an immunocompromised patient with or without a lot of uh, inflammation. And, and a pearl, if you see an extensive syncytium of infected keratinocytes with involving the adnexal structures, you should think about an immunocompromised patient. If you get a non-specific ulcer, uh, immunoperoxidase staining for herpes can be uh, effective to help you with that. So these are the classic lesions of an early, uh, the tightly grouped herpetiform vesicles there. And this is what a zinc preparation looks like. So you can see that the chromatin here, this is what we call margination of the chromatin. It kind of gets at the margin <laughs> nucleus. And this is a multinucleated cell, more than one nucleus in that cell. So that's a zinc prep. And this is a biopsy. And notice uh, it's a blister, and it gives an acantholytic blister where the cells falling apart. They're also ballooning degeneration. It's both a viral infected process causing the ballooning generation, and then the cells kind of fall apart from one another. And you can see that the cells are present both in the middle of the blister, at the top of the blister, and also at the bottom of the blister. So if you're going to do a zinc preparation, Scrape everything, scrape the, get the bottom, get the top, get the middle, put everything on the slide. Don't just scrape the base of the blister because the, the cells may be floating in the, in the blister fluid. So if you want to get a positive result, um, scrape everything and put it on the slide and then you can stain it with uh, a right stain or, or a Giemsa stain. Now uh, there's also a direct immunofluorescence test. So if you're in the hospital, maybe it's late at night, maybe there's not a microscope around, you're not sure what's going on, you think you might have herpes infection, you can take a smear and take it to the, to the uh, micro lab, and they can actually do this rapid uh, fluorescence inside to hybridization uh, test on it. And uh, they look at it uh, under a fluorescence microscope and it can give you a positive result. So if you're not really sure, and uh, you don't have a good, you don't have a lot of confidence in looking at a zinc prep, uh, just remember that this is available to you in the clinical lab if you're in a hospital situation. Here's another example. And this is also a herpes virus infection. This is in a patient that was immunocompromised. If you look at the periphery of this lesion, it's kind of got that translucent uh, border to it. And it's almost kind of almost uh, annular over here. That is a good clue that it might be a herpes virus infection. It, it's not obviously pathognomonic. So this is the kind of thing you're gonna to need to do a scraping or maybe a biopsy of to make a diagnosis. But this is an example of a so-called Baruchus herpes infection in an immunocompromised patient. 
And then this is a biopsy of one of those lesions, and you can see that it has a confluent syncytium, basically, of these multinucleated epithelial giant cells here. So every cell here is infected. It's involving the full thickness of the epidermis. It's involving a nexal structures. It goes down into sebaceous glands. So whenever you see something like this, this is not normal to get this um, in a patient that is immuno immunocompetent. So if you get this degree of in involvement, it's a sign that something is wrong. So the patient might have uh, an underlying cancer, they might have HIV infection, something like that. So just remember if you see that, if your pathologist reports that back to you, um, make sure your patient is an immunocompromised. Here's another situation we see not uncommonly. The patient comes in with these nonspecific ulcers, um, it does have that same sort of border a little bit. So if you wanted to get the best yield on a biopsy or a scraping, you'd kind of want to go here, not in the center of these ulcers, because it's going to show basically nothing. But if you do a biopsy this, it may show something like this, a nonspecific ulcer. You suspect that it may be caused by an infection, maybe herpes, you're not sure. It's in a good location for that. And uh, just, you just can't make a diagnosis. So a lot of times when you get kind of a late stage lesion, you don't really see the nice multinucleated giant cells, you see kind of the ghosts of cells that were present once uh, that are mostly dead. And if you do an immunoperoxidase stain for herpes infection, sometimes it's positive. Not always, but occasionally it's positive like here, and that can give you uh, a diagnosis and you put the patient on therapy. And a lot of these, when they're immunocompromised like this, uh, the herpes is uh, resistant to acyclovir, and you have to resort to other therapies like ribavirin um, and things of that nature. So remember that also, that a lot of these are actually uh, resistant to acyclovir. Cytomegalovirus, again, uh, usually transmitted to the respiratory tract, but in patients that are immunocompromised, you get GI involvement. Uh, they can shed this uh, in, the, in the stool, and they can get a, a perianal uh, ulceration, pretty common manifestation, and that usually involves non-keratinocytic cells, like endothelial cells and fibroblasts. We used to see a lot of this in, in the AIDS era. We don't see as much of it today with uh, heart therapy, but if you get someone that maybe hasn't been on heart and they've got a significantly low uh, CD4 count, they can get this, and we do see it on occasion. Um, there are quite a few different uh, clinical patterns of disease, ranging anywhere from neonatal involvement uh, CMV mononucleosis can be seen. You can get eye involvement, encephalitis, and adrenalitis. And uh, probably the most common thing that we were seeing when patients were immunocompromised with these perianal ulcers, um, the pe people often would have HSV infection to get co-infected with CMV. Uh, so the CMV may, may be a hitchhiker, but if it's present, it's important because it's a sign that the patient actually does have a CMV infection, and they may be more at risk for the a retinal involvement or renal involvement, in which you don't want to miss that. And there is treatment for uh, CMV, obviously, with gancyclovir. A um, couple other manifestations, palpable percurrent papules, uh, especially like in kids, neonates, and the sign of the extramedular hematopoiesis. Uh, and if you see somebody that comes with a weird suntan in the middle of the winter when they shouldn't have a suntan, think about the possibility of them having an underlying adrenal infection. Um, especially if it's a person that's immunocompromised. So here's an example of a, of a chronic uh, perianal ulcer. Yeah. Admin, just. What are you having trouble with something? No, I'm just trying to try and mute all real quick. Uh, hang on a second. We're going to mute participants here. This thing is not very. I uh, can't get it. Okay, so that's I'll fine. try. Okay. Anyway, this is a uh, perianal erosive dermatitis. And uh, another lesion on the gentleman's uh, penile area, this ulcer again, when biopsy didn't see any herpes. Here it is, managed participants. Um, let me mute everybody here. There we go. Okay, cool. Uh, just say no for now. Okay, good. Sorry about that. Okay, and this was uh, actually on biopsy, showed only C and V. Okay. A uh, child with the blueberry muffin uh, syndrome. This, these were extramedular hematopoiesis. So this isn't the actual CMV itself here. This is due to CMV causing bone marrow suppression, and then you get extramedular hematopoiesis. And this gentleman was HIV infected. You can see he's cachectic, uh, developed this hyperpigmentation, uh, had adrenal failure, causing his hyperpigmentation due to CMV involving his adrenal gland. So diagnosis of this, 
Uh, ideally, if you can see the cells, and I'll show you some of that in a minute, viral cultures, uh, just like with the herpes infection, you can do direct immunofluorescence or DNA and citro hybridization or IPOX or polymerase chain reaction. And uh, once again, if you see the virus in the ulcer, it may not be the cause of the ulcer, but it is a sign that the patient does have CMV infection. Here's another example, these perianal ulcers, HIV positive patient, uh, again, ulcerated lesion. And if you look at this area right over here, uh, this is where the CMV was involved. And this gives you two uh, manifestations when it's involving the cells. And notice these are not keratinocytes. These are probably fibroblasts and histiocytes. You get the so-called owl's eye appearance in the nucleus, and then these little eosinophilic inclusions in the cytoplasm. So that's a sign of cytomegalovirus infection. Cytomegalo, large cell, is what that means. Another example, the so-called owl's eye appearance, and then these little granules in the cytoplasm over here. And this is an immunoperoxidase stain directed to the CMV itself inside these cells here. So again, just like with the HSV, if you're not sure, take a smear, take it to the laboratory. They can do the same uh, test on your smear and get a rapid bedside diagnosis for you. Uh, Epstein-Barr virus infection, which is another human herpes virus infection, is HHV type 4. There'll be a lot of different clinical manifestations of this we see in dermatology. Um, early on, they can get a nondescript viral exanthem that looks just like a morbilliform eruption. Um, you can get uh, uh, infectious mono, and you can get aphthous ulcers. These are known as Lipschitz ulcers. They can be seen in the, uh, the oral cavity or also in the uh, genital area. You can also get oral hairy leukoplakia, and then you can get uh, B-cell lymphomas and post-transplant uh, lymphoproliferative disorder. So there's a lot of bad things that, that Epstein-Barr virus can do. And then again, if you look at the making the diagnosis here, uh, histology, IPOX, I'll show you electromicrograph of this in a minute. These are the so-called Lipschitz ulcers. So if you see a young person comes in, they've kind of been feeling ill, maybe they've got a little fever, uh, feels for some lymph nodes, if they got a little lymphadenopathy, and then they have these aphthous-like ulcers, this can be one of the early manifestations of uh, Epstein-Barr virus infection. And if you look at it under the microscope, it pretty much looks like an aphthous ulcer, but you can also sometimes get some thrombo uh, thrombos blood vessels and some vasculitis with this. So it's probably due to the virus causing some infection of the endothelial cells with secondary <laughs> thrombosis of the blood vessels. This is uh, oral hairy leukoplakia. You get these white verrucous plaques uh, often on the sides of the tongue, uh, can be on the dorsal surface of the tongue, can sometimes be on the buccal mucosa or even on the hard palate. And uh, when you took, take a biopsy of that, you can see this marked epithelial hyperplasia with this pallor of the epithelium at the surface of it. And uh, these individual cells that have these, these nuclei are hyperchromatic and, and they have this pallor within them. Uh, this is a, a manifestation of the viral infection, the ballooning viral infection of the epithelium. And this is uh, an immunoperoxidase stain directed to EBV involving the, the cells. And this is an electron micrograph. Every one of these little structures right here are viral particles of Epstein-Barr virus. So that's uh, EBV in a patient with oral hairy leukoplakia. Now, there are a number of different, uh, moving from viruses to bacteria. Um, there's two ways bacteria can evolve the skin. You can get acute bacterial infections or you can get more chronic bacterial infections. We'll talk about uh, both of those. And again, you can use light microscopy to help you. You can use, uh, you know, looking at the, the organisms in tissue. If you see them in there, that's helpful. But it can be difficult in some cases. And then we do have some other techniques, uh, immunoperoxidase stain, DNA probes, PCR. Uh, these are generally less commonly used than with the viruses, but they are available to us. Uh, septic vasculitis, this is basically where we get infarcts due to bacterial emboli that involve small blood vessels. And usually here you see vascular thrombosis with a lot of intact neutrophils with relatively limited minimal leukocytoclasia. So that helps you in distinguishing between this and leukocytoclastic vasculitis where you get leukocytoclasia with the eosinophils. Here you get intact neutrophils. And the organisms can be relatively few and difficult to visualize unless you're dealing with uh, an immunocompromised patient or someone that's, that's got uh, a very virulent uh, bacterium like Pseudomonas. So here's some examples of the kind of lesions that we see, these little acral infarcts. Bacterial emboli go to these small blood vessels at the, the ends of your, 
like your hands and toes like this. So these are, are actual infarcts in your skin here. So again, thrombosis, small and or larger blood vessels. You can get some fiber into the blood vessel walls, but usually it's mostly thrombosis of the blood vessels. So the vessels are the things that are compromised here. And then you get the overlying epidermal change with, uh, with epidermal necrosis. So here's an example. Notice the lesion is taken near volar skin. And if you look here, you're going to see these blood vessels are thrombosed, basically, with intact neutrophils. So normal, intact polys, blood vessels compromised. Another example, notice this blood vessel is, is thrombosed, filled up here with this material, and then you get intact neutrophils surrounding it. No leukocytoclasia, no fibrin in the wall of blood vessels. The blood vessel lumen is thrombosed here. So again, difficult to see organisms in, in many of these. Um, if it's an immunocompromised patient, they may have very limited inflammation, but can have a, a, a lot of organisms. Pseudomonas, you get quite a few, but if you look at gonococcus, meningococcus, very few hard to identify, um, staph sometimes a lot, uh, and strep almost never, fungi like candida, you can usually see those too. So here's an example of a gram stain of a, of a septic vasculitis, just don't see any organisms there. And that's really more characteristic than, than what we see um, in a patient that in most, most cases don't see very many organisms. Uh, botryomycosis, this is basically a verrucous pyogenic bacterial infection usually caused by staph where you actually get colonies of bacteria that start growing in the skin. They shouldn't normally have colonies, little clusters of, of grains of bacteria in your skin. Um, these are usually found in immunocompromised patients. And you can usually see these when they're in, in the tissue. So here is an example of this verrucous plaque on this person. Uh, clinician really wasn't sure what it was. They thought it might be an infection. They did take a biopsy of it. Here's another example, a small little papule and two or three of these. This was also due to, to botryomycosis. This is what a biopsy will look like in that situation. You get an, a diffuse infiltrate in the dermis, neutrophils with maybe some granulomas inflammation. But these little structures over here uh, that are filled with uh, little eosinophilic colonies of bacteria. And this actually grew out staph uh, in this case. So this was uh, botryomycosis caused by a pyogenic bacterial infection. Uh, no cardiosis, uh, most commonly no cardia brasiliensis and no cardia asteroides. Uh, this is pretty uncommon in the skin unless the person's immunocompromised. It's seen most commonly in the setting of patients that have pulmonary alveolar proteinosis. So that's a board uh, type of question you might get. Um, the skin is involved in about 30% of cases. And they give you these nodules and abscesses with variable verrucous thickening of the skin. Uh, you get the sulfur granules in the tissue when you see them. Uh, you don't see them all the time, but it's helpful. And uh, these usually are weakly acid fast. So you can get some positive staining uh, with fight stain. And if you do an anti-mycobacterial mycobacterial antibody, you can get some cross reaction and some staining with that. So this is the guy's trunk. And you can see he's got all of these draining sinuses and, and uh, verrucous areas here. He had the underlying pulmonary alveolar proteinosis. And this was just basically transepidermally eliminating these organisms through his skin. Uh, this is another patient that was immunocompromised that had these pyogenic granuloma-like lesions that were caused by nocardia. Uh, this other person had these sort of dusky abscess-like lesions that were uh, draining superficially, also caused by nocardia. Uh, here's the biopsy, which shows this diffuse infiltrate in the dermis of suppuration uh, with variable amounts of granulomatous inflammation. This person did not have uh, any of the sulfur granules uh, maybe had something that was a little bit of an amorphous deposit of something there, but pretty uh, nonspecific. And uh, special stains were negative for routine uh, fight staining, but this was an, a, an antibody directed to mycobacterium tuberculosis, which highlighted some of this material here, which was suggestion that that probably was either due to atypical mycobacteria. Uh, it actually did grow out in Ocardia. And Ocardia will grow out, it's not a super slow growing organism, but it does have to be plated out in. in in a special media, so make sure if you're suspicious of this, you notify the laboratory that it may be a fastidious organism and that they plate it out for other things. You want to uh, have these things cultured for aerobes and anaerobes. And here's what it looked like under the microscope, uh, I mean, when it grew out of the auger plate. Actinomyces, again, uh, caused by actinomyces species, actinomycosis. Some of these are actually caused by streptomyces and some species of nocardia. Um, this is a gram 
positive filamentous bacteria. These also contain grains. Uh, and this may be seen in the uh, people that undergo dental procedures, get these draining sinuses. Uh, this was another example of somebody that had actinomycosis occurring on their skin here on the, on the trunk. And again, it sort of looks like nocardia. It's kind of similar to it, if you will, both histologically uh, and even the organisms can kind of look similar, similar when you see the grains. So again, a separative inflammatory reaction here. And here's one of the grains with the, the nocardia. They, they call it the ray fungus. It's got this little central area with this proteinaceous materials, debris. And then you see the little uh, organisms at the periphery. And this is what these uh, actinomyces organisms look like when you grow them in culture. They kind of look like little uh, flying saucers, if you will. Bacillary angiomatosis. Uh, again, this is uh, seen most commonly in HIV positive immunocompromised patients with low CD4 counts. Uh, these are caused by Bartonella organisms. And these are the same organisms cause cat scratch disease and trench fever. Um, we used to see a lot of this in the old days before heart. Uh, we probably see maybe a case or two a year today. It's really pretty uncommon. Uh, we get it most of the time when, when this is submitted to rule this out. It's, it's uh, uh, Kaposi sarcoma versus this, and it's almost always KS. But occasionally we do see this still today. Um, the lesions kind of look like little pygenic granulomas or these little uh, red cherry angioma-like lesions that can be uh, just a solitary or just a few, or they can be widespread multiple over <clears throat> large parts of the skin. It can also be subcutaneous. They can even get into bone and they can be systemic. They can get into the liver, uh, the spleen, then reported in the brain, other locations. Uh, this was actually a patient that was immunocompetent that had uh, the, the disease, actually had a parrot that was walking across his arm and inoculated his skin with, uh, with the organism. And if you look at it under the microscope, it, it really looks pretty much like a pyogenic granuloma. It's got a, uh, a, a lobular capillary proliferation, but it tends to be a little bit more inflammatory uh, than a pyogenic granuloma. It can have neutrophils. It can have uh, these actually clusters of neutrophils in some areas. And some of the, sometimes you can actually see the, uh, the cells, the endothelial cells can be somewhat atypical with mitotic figures and kind of simulate a neoplasm. And if you do a stain with the Worth and Starry stain, it highlights these organisms very, very prominently. So all of these structures here are the actual organism. And if you look at it under the electron microscope, you can see these gram-negative cocobacillary organisms that then end up causing uh, the condition. So that's uh, bacillary angiomatosis. Now, switching from that to some chronic bacterial infections, here we're dealing with things like AFB and whatnot. Um, these can be a lot tougher to see under the microscope, can be a lot tougher to culture. So you have to maybe sometimes even result to things like polymerase chain reaction. Um, and sometimes you have to culture them more than once. Um, the clinical appearance can be somewhat unusual. Uh, and sometimes you have to take more than one biopsy. I had a patient one time that had been to a nail salon and had what we really suspected was uh, an AFB infection. We had to biopsy her in culture five times before we finally got an organism out. Um, so again, this can be, you have to be diligent about this, and sometimes you may end up just having to kind of treat empirically. Uh, the, the clinical morphology can be quite unusual. This patient had lesions that look almost like a paniculitis caused by uh, AFB. Uh, this patient had these multiple small draining ulcers here over both legs, and this was also caused by an atypical mycobacterial infection. You get multiple different types of histologic patterns. Uh, you can get the separative granulomatous, uh, the dense diffuse process with pseudoepitheliomas hyperplasia. But in this case, it was more of a deep uh, abscess-like reaction with granulomatous inflammation. And when you're dealing with a patient that's immunocompromised, the uh, histology can look weird. It doesn't always look like uh, classic, what you see in a patient that's immunocompetent. And uh, the number of organisms can be very few. Sometimes you'll see just one or two, and that's all you need to make the diagnosis. You don't have to see a lot of them. And uh, you see this one little cluster of, of organisms here in a patient with uh, cutaneous atypical mycobacterial infection. Hansen's disease, we still see uh, you know, cases of this, and it doesn't have to be from patients that are from other countries. There are a number of cases that are endogenously acquired, uh, especially patients that have been dealing with uh, uh, armadillos. And uh, we get a few cases every year from South Texas, East Texas, where patients uh, have been uh, butchering armadillos. Um, 
If you look at the very early stage of indeterminate hands, it can be very, very subtle, just a very sparse perineural, perivascular infiltrate, often with a negative fight stain, the tuberculoid form, which gives you a sarcoidal histologic pattern. So tuberculoid disease goes sarcoidal histology, and the fight stain there is almost always negative. And one clue that can help you distinguish tuberculoid Hansen's from sarcoid is that the granulomas tend to be elongated and tend to follow nerves. So that's helpful, but the fight stain is almost always negative um, in that situation. <clears throat> and then macromatous disease, very, very dense, diffuse involvement with uh, xanthomatous appearance, and then the histoid form, which is an interesting form. Uh, the cells can develop almost, the histiocytes can develop sort of a spindle cell morphology that can simulate a soft tissue neoplasm. So here's an example of Hansen's disease. I've got you know four or five lesions. This would probably be maybe uh, indeterminate, probably tuberculoid or borderline tuberculoid Hansen's disease. Lesion on this guy's face. Uh, again, a, a larger lesion of plaque. Again, probably a borderline form of Hansen's. And then more widespread disease where you're kind of getting more into lepromatous uh, Hansen's. And then this uh, morphology where you get a very diffuse infiltrate with the foamy appearing cells, Virchow cells, uh, these are gonna be loaded with microorganisms here. So if you do a fight stain on this, you're gonna have no trouble finding the organisms. It's more challenging when you're dealing with the tuberculoid forms. So there you may have to resort to PCR, uh, things of that nature. And you can send off a specimen, Han the Hansen's disease clinic in Carville still is, is functional. It doesn't see as many cases as it used to, but uh, you can actually send specimens to them and they can work it up for you and they'll do PCR on it. Takes a while to get the result back, but it's something that you can do. Um, syphilis, far more common today than it was 10, 15 years ago. We're seeing a resurgence of syphilis, so you have to be thinking about this. Uh, it's not something that uh, you should just assume we don't see anymore, because we, we see it, gosh, we probably diagnose a, a couple of cases a month here under the microscope. Uh, so again, you just have to have a good uh, clinical suspicion. The histology can be very helpful, but it's true in syphilis. You can see a lot of different histologic manifestations. Um, dark field exam, uh, nobody does dark fields today, but um, if your hospital does have the ability to do a dark field and you're seeing a patient in the hospital, you can do a scraping. It's uh, you basically take a scraping, you use saline, you put it on a, on a glass slide, and you put it on this dark field, you actually see the organisms moving um, in the dark field. But most of the time we're doing special stains, the best stain today is an immunoproxidase stain directed against T. pallidum. Uh, and again, you can see, if you see the granulomatous infiltrate in syphilis, it's not as epithelioid as in sarcoidosis. And one thing the textbooks talk about is endothelial cell swelling. That is a very non specific finding that I never look for. Um, it's virtually worthless under the microscope. So I would never hang my hat on looking for so-called endothelial cell swelling. It's hopefully working its way out of our literature. If you see the primary chancre, you get a very dense diffuse infiltrate with lymphocytes, a lot of plasma cells. So, so seeing plasma cells is something that is a relatively true thing in syphilis. If you see it, you should think about it in the proper setting, although you can see plasma cells in a lot of other set, settings. But if you don't see plasma cells, it's less likely to be syphilis. The secondary form gives you the classic form of superficial deep psoriasis and lichenoid process with the plasma cells and with histiocytes. And then the tertiary form, a dense diffuse process with granulomas, inflammation, caseation, necrosis, and plasma cells. So this is a primary chancre, uh, multiple chancres in this patient here. And uh, this is a dark field exam. If you ever see this, it's really cool. You see these spirochetes actually just squiggling because uh, they're alive under the microscope, but uh, hardly anybody ever does this anymore. And uh, this is a chancre. So again, it shows an ulceration with uh, these large, these dilated blood vessels, this mixed infiltrate with neutrophils, with plasma cells. And uh, it's basically a relatively nonspecific finding, but you will see plasma cells as well as neutrophils. So it kind of looks like an aptus ulcer in many ways. So you just have to kind of have a, an index of suspicion. If you do a special stain, this is a warp and starry stain. You can see all of the spirochetes here. They're these squiggly coiled organisms. They're elongated. Uh, they're not like Langerhans cells that, that also are highlighted with a silver stain, uh, and melanocytes are highlighted with silver stain. So these are these long coiled uh, spirochetes here. And this is more classic secondary syphilis, the papulosquamous form, widespread disease, the so called uh, split papules, the edge of this guy's uh, mouth here. Those are classic findings for syphilis. 
and then the lesions on the palms and soles, the, uh, the uh, collarette of scale at the periphery, the ham-colored papules. So those are classic findings of syphilis. And this is a, a secondary syphilis biopsy, superficial and deep, relatively diffuse infiltrate here with tons of plasma cells. So this is secondary syphilis, and this is an immunoperoxidase stain, which is a lot cleaner stain. We like this stain. We use this in our laboratory. I think most people are using the stain more now over the silver stains, and you can see the spirochetes are highlighted beautifully here in the epidermis. Okay. This is tertiary syphilis. We don't really see this all that commonly. Uh, in some patients with HIV infection, they can have weird manifestations of syphilis. They can have a primary chancre. Then they can develop secondary disease at the same time and sometimes get tertiary lesions all at the same time because uh, their immune system is kind of unusual and, and they don't respond as, uh, in, the, in the same fashion as the classic forms described in the literature. So here you get this relatively non-specific dense diffuse infiltrate with uh, histiocytes and a lot of plasma cells. And if you do a special stain, you'll often see the spirochetes uh, there also. That's much less common um, than we see the secondary and, and primary forms. Uh, Switching gears now to the cutaneous and fungal infections. Again, the best way to diagnose these, if you can, is just looking at it at routine microscopy. Uh, but again, we do have other techniques that are available to us. And just like with the viral uh, exanthems I mentioned to you before, like herpes and CMV, you can actually do smears of these lesions too. And uh, we had a patient that I had a number of years ago that uh, had a biopsy. She was an immunocompromised patient. Biopsy just showed a nonspecific inflammatory reaction. Cultures were negative. Uh, finally, a, an individual suggested he was a clinical pathologist. Why don't you take the smear and send it down to the lab? We'll do a special stain on it. They did a bedside smear on it, and lo and behold, it was positive for histo. And uh, even though the cultures were negative, um, she, we actually treated her for histo, and the diagnosis was made on the bedside immunofluorescence smear. So just remember that that's available to you as well. So speaking of histo, it can have a lot of different clinical manifestations, especially when you're an immunocompromised uh, patient. And uh, they're actually, this uh, anti-mycobacterial antibodies can cross-react, and it's actually a positive cross-reaction. So it can kind of give you an increased sensitivity of diagnosis. This was a patient that was an HIV-positive patient that came in with these nonspecific papules on his face, uh, clinically very, very nondescript. I don't think anyone would would think of, uh, of histoplasmosis in a case like this, but this guy was immunocompromised. So when you're dealing with an immunocompromised patient, um, anything goes. You have, to, you have to have a high, high index of suspicion that you may be dealing with an infectious disease. Uh, here you see a, the biopsy from that patient. It showed this pretty sparse, nonspecific infiltrate. Um, it really looked almost like leukocytoclastic vasculitis. It's got this neutrophilic infiltrate with these uh, leukocytoclastic broken down neutrophils. The, uh, if you look carefully, you can see that there's something inside some of these cells here, pretty non-specific, but the special stain here for uh, PAS stain was positive, highlighting all of these organisms. So this was an example of histoplasmosis that histologically simulated vasculitis, and that's in the literature. Um, histo, for some reason, both the organisms can kind of look like leukocytoclasia, and they can also actually get a neutrophilic infiltrate uh, that breaks down. So, um, it is something that you can see sometimes in patients that are immunocompromised. This is the uh, anti-mycobacterial antibody stain that highlighted the organism. So this is not actually AFB that's being highlighted. It's histo that cross-react with the antibody. And if you look at histo and culture, it kind of gives you this white fluffy colony that looks sort of like a dermatophyte. Not exactly, but a little bit like a microsporum culture. And then the culture itself gives you these uh, these yeast-like spores that have these small little spikes at the periphery. So that's what the actual culture of histo looks like uh, when you look at that under the microscope. Now blastomycosis, uh, also called uh, North American blastomycosis or Gilchrist disease, Chicago disease, um, is a dimorphic fungus caused by blastomyces dermatitidis. It's endemic in the Great Lakes area, but also in the Mississippi and Ohio River Valley areas. Um, the classic manifestation is a mild pulmonary infection that then can disseminate to the skin when the patient becomes immunocompromised. If you look at the biopsies that these patients get under the microscope, it gives a suppurative granulomatous inflammatory reaction with the epidermal hyperplasia, and it gives you these broad-based budding yeasts under the microscope. So that's uh, a pretty classic uh, when you look at that histologically. Here's a patient that had blasto 
again, uh, had the, uh, the pulmonary infection years later, got immunocompromised and started developing this widespread eruption of these verrucous papules. Here's the biopsy showing the separative granulomatous inflammatory infiltrate. And even with h &E, you can see the organisms in here when you start looking at, at uh, higher magnification and uh, you see some of them right here. The, the broad-based buds, if you will, of blastomycosis. So that's pretty characteristic. And here's a PAS stain. And this is inside a histiocyte here. And uh, this is what the organisms look like in culture. So this is blastomycosis. Uh, Coxy, disseminated coxy automycosis. So it's endemic in the lower Sonoran life zone area. Once again, usually at a pulmonary disease that kind of goes away and then later on the individual becomes immunocompromised, often with diabetes is, is a real uh, common classic uh, situation. The patient gets uh, uncontrolled diabetes later in life and then the coxy disseminates, um, can be associated with erythema nodosum. And uh, we actually see these patients in the HIV positive uh, individuals as well. So this patient again got immunocompromised, developed a spread eruption of these numerous Verrucous papules and nodules over the wide spread. Oh, okay. Um, this patient uh, okay. developed only a few scattered lesions, looking almost hey, like neoplasms. And the biopsy here showed coxie. <laughs> Somebody, so can you guys mute right. your phone over there? Somebody's kind of got a. Let me see if I can just call again here. Okay, sounds good. Thanks. No. Okay, so it's it's also this non-specific ulcer in this case was okay. caused by coxie as right. well in this patient. So you can get a lot of different manifestations of coxie. And uh, patients that are immunocompromised, again, can give weird manifestations. This showed almost a diffuse necrotic ulcerated area and uh, some histiocytes here at the periphery. And then scattered organisms that were the spherules of coxie seen here with a special stain. So again, coxie usually will give you the separate granulomas information for the epidermal hyperplasia, but in an immunocompromised patient, it may not. You, and you really need to look for the spherules to make the diagnosis. The uh, organisms in culture, again, give you this kind of white, fluffy colony, and they give you the barrel-shaped arthrospores. That's a classic uh, histologic finding of the arthrospores that you see in culture. And so that is something that could be a very good board question. So I would strongly remember the barrel shaped arthrospores uh, that you see with coxie. Uh, crypto, uh, most commonly again an immunocompromised patient, but we're seeing this now in patients that are on biologics and patients that are immunocompromised relatively uh, in a minor uh, form, so they don't have to be profoundly immunocompromised to get crypto. The most common manifestation is meningitis, but the skin may be involved in five to 10 percent of cases. And this can look a lot like many different things, like molluscum, like paniculitis, like cellulitis. Uh, usually on a biopsy, you can see the organisms. Um, the classic board question is that this grows on bird seed auger. So remember that. Uh, this was an AIDS patient that came in with these uh, lesions that were thought to be clinically molluscum, turned out to be uh, crypto. And they had widespread number of these lesions. This was a patient that had what looked like a, an abscess. This patient had uh, looked like cellulitis, also due to crypto. And if you do a biopsy of crypto, there's really two main patterns, but the, the one that's the most common is the so-called gelatinous form, where you see these clusters of organisms. And all of this pale material is due to the mucogelatinous capsule uh, of crypto. So crypto has a capsule and you can stain that with both PAS stain here and you can also stain it with a mucicarmine stain. So mucin will highlight the capsule and then you can actually stain the organisms with a GMS stain as you can see here. So this is, uh, is crypto and that's if the board doesn't have that somewhere I'll be surprised. So be prepared for that as well. This is the uh, organism and culture, and then you can see the India ink preparation on a patient that had meningitis. Uh, so this is the black India ink. This is the capsule of the organism. So it's not actually staining the organism. The organism basically it's kind of giving you a negative stain. It, it, it pushes the ink away, if you will, uh, when you have that many organisms in tissue. Uh, Sporotrichosis, 
sporothrix shinkii. There's a lot of different cutaneous forms here. You can get the lymphocutaneous type that migrates up the lymph nodes. Uh, you can get the fixed cutaneous type. The organisms are classically difficult to see in sporo, but this also can sometimes cross-react with this antimicrobacterial antibody. So this is the classic lymphocutaneous form. You get the the, the classic story of the gardener that, that gets uh, pricked by a rose thorn and then starts getting multiple leaves and starts spreading proximally. Um, I would recommend knowing the differential diagnosis of lesions that can give you lymphocutaneous spread of their condition, like atypical mycobacteria can also do that. Um, this was an AIDS patient that had this widespread uh, eruption. It, it, sure, it looked like an infectious disease, as you can see here. He had this, these, this was a lipoma here, but he had all these areas that were ulcerated nodules and whatnot. And uh, interestingly enough, when he was cultured, uh, he actually grew out staph. He had staph uh, bacteremia, and then the lesions that were cultured also grew out staph. And then he was sent home on, uh, on antibiotics for his staph. And then about a couple of weeks later, the organisms of sporo grew out of his skin also, and that was kind of missed. No one saw that until he came back in the clinic for follow-up, and then that culture showed up as positive, and they started treating him for sporo. And this is actually what his biopsy looked like, and this was actually not picked up originally. It showed this separative uh, inflammation with relatively limited, a little bit of granulomatous inflammation here. But he had all of these structures in the interstitium here are organisms of sporo, and they were so numerous, too numerous to count, that the original pathologist looked at the slide, didn't even see them. He, did, he sort of glossed over, he thought it was just an artifact, and all of these were sporo, and eventually they grew out, uh, but this, the or it grew out after about a week as opposed to the bacteria, which grew out in, in a couple of days. So uh, this was the sporo in his tissue. And they give you these little cigar-shaped uh, structures that's the classic sort of morphology of spore, the old cigar-shaped uh, spores. Some of them are round also, but uh, that's what you see with spore trichosis. And in culture, it kind of gives you this, uh, this grayish gray green culture, as you see here. And the organisms give it these thin filamentous hyphae with these little tiny spores that come off at 90 degree angles. So this is what uh, sporo looks like in culture. Uh, occasionally we'll see patients with, with other bad optimistic fungi, uh, things like mucor, rhizopus, alternaria, aspergillus. Um, these are obviously extremely dangerous, life-threatening diseases, so you want to pick these up as, as quickly as you possibly can. Uh, the cultures, the good news about it is they tend to grow up pretty quickly, so if you're not sure you want to, uh, you want to culture these, and, and they usually get a result in a couple of days, so that's, that's helpful, but sometimes a couple of days can be uh, serious and patients can die during that time. So if you can see in, in the biopsy, that's, that's a quicker way to make a diagnosis. Um, the zygomycotic infections, mucor, rhizopus, absidia, they give you these large aseptate hyphae. Sometimes you can see these little septal-like structures in tissue, though, which can be sometimes confusing, and, and people think that they're not really these organisms because they give you these little septal-like structures. So don't don't just uh, use that 100% to make the diagnosis. The, the individual hyphalums are usually way larger, though, than the hyphae you see with like a dermatophyte, for example. Uh, and they're also in the dermis and the, and the fat, and I'll show you that in a minute. Um, diabetics are predisposed to getting this. They get into the nasal sinus, then it goes right into the brain and can lead to, to death. Uh, you may be, maybe sometimes difficulty with routine stains, you need to do a PAS stain. And if you see organisms in the fat with minimal inflammation, um, think about one of these organisms. This was a lady that had pemphigus that developed these nodules and also had this erosive process in addition to her pemphigus. She was on high dose prednisone. You can see how Cushing, she, Cushingoid she is. And this was her biopsy. The epidermis is totally necrotic. She had almost no inflammation down here. And then um, I'll show you at higher magnification. These are the dead uh, sebaceous glands. She had these structures that were positive with this PAS stain, just infiltrating the epidermis and this in the stratum corneum, down in the uh, in the papillary dermis, extending all the way down into subcutaneous fat, and that was due to mucor. And uh, she actually kept telling us at the bedside that she was going to die, and, and uh, she she nearly did die. Once we made the diagnosis, we got her on uh, amphotericin, and she actually did okay. But uh, this is what the organism looks like in in uh, culture. You can see the uh, little aseptate hyphae here, 
with the bread mold like uh, spores. And uh, this grows out in about a day or two. So it grows really, really quickly. So that's the only good thing about it. If you get it in culture, it'll grow pretty fast. You can make a diagnosis pretty quickly. But you've got to get these patients on treatment really fast or they can die from it. Um, Alternariosis. Uh, again, uh, these can give you these dusky purple uh, areas where the skin is dying and sloughing, and so aspergillus looks like this. These are all in the same sort of family of these uh, these these organisms. Really, aren't they? Don't shouldn't grow in in uh, in, in humans that are healthy. So there are, these people are always immunocompromised, and uh, they often will have a low neutrophil count with this situation. We don't see these infections as much with the HIV positive. These are people that usually have leukemia or something like that, and they're on a chemotherapy for that. They get uh, low uh, neutrophil counts. And uh, this was a patient, they give these very nondescript sort of gunmetal gray appearance. When you see that, that's a sign of an infarction. And so you really want to jump on this right away. You don't want to let this sit for a while. You want to biopsy this. And notice it's kind of got this reform uh, purpura pattern. And Warren Piet talks about this. He says, when you see that, it's a sign of a deeper vascular um, uh, thrombosis. So you want to biopsy that right away because those vessels are being compromised for one reason or another. This is another patient just had this diffuse, uh, basically they're just getting gangrenous type changes here in their digits. And this is due to the fungus that's actually growing in and, and growing into these blood vessels here. So uh, if you look at it on the microscope, alternary can actually give you a chromoblastomycotic appearance, but it can also give you this pattern that looks like aspergillus where you get these abundant hyphal elements in the dermis uh, with these pigmented organisms. So here was a patient, notice there's almost no inflammation because the patient was very, very profoundly immunocompromised. And these are blood vessels that are thrombosed and dead and basically everything is just dying because there's just an infarct here. And these blood vessels are being colonized and grown, overgrown by these uh, organisms. You can see they've almost got these little sort of chain of grenade-like morphology. And uh, here you see the uh, GMS stain highlighting these organisms and tissue. So uh, this is a bad situation. You need to make the diagnosis as soon as you can and get these patients on appropriate therapy. This is what your organisms look like in culture. They give you these little grenade-like structures here and they give you this dematiaceous growth uh, on the auger plate. Now, rarely we'll see people that get more than one pathogen at the same time. And these are usually people that are immunocompromised again. And uh, this was a case he was a Mexican uh, immigrant who came over this Verrucas nodule on his knee. He was the Middle Eastern coast of Mexico, and he had worked as a fisherman. And uh, he had these uh, non-tender lesions that had drained these little black dots, according to him, and came in with this Verrucas nodule. It, it didn't look exactly like this, but it was analogous to this. It was on his knee as opposed to on his foot here. But this is what you might see like in Madura mycosis, for example. And uh, this was his biopsy. You can see it's taken again from Volar skin, and he's got this granulomatous inflammation of the dermis with these dark structures in here. And this, these are the organisms of a pigmented fungus causing a, a mycetoma in his skin. So he had a pigmented mycetoma, and this was the granulomatous inflammation in a different area. And this one was actually positive for AFB. So he actually had two different things going on. He actually had an immerinum infection from his exposure to seawater and whatnot and got traumatically reduced, but he also got a soil infection with a eumycotic mycetoma. Uh, so he had two different things going on in his skin and basically probably traumatically induced in those situations. Um, so the last thing I'm gonna talk about briefly are some uh, parasitic and ectoparasitic infestations. And uh, here the best way to diagnose these is just to see the organisms uh, in or on the tissue uh, so uh, usually uh, you can maybe in some cases do scrapings or things like that to look at the tissues of the organs when they're not actually on the tissue. And sometimes there are some other techniques available in dealing with protozoal infections. Um, the first one of these is leash mania. And uh, we actually see uh, a few of these cases in our part of the country, uh, in Texas. They're, they're not always uh, coming from Mexico or from the Middle East or places like that where it's endemic uh, in higher numbers. We see it. Um, endemically now in Texas. Uh, we've actually studied this a few years ago. And we found the, uh, the fly that actually causes uh, the organisms now present in Texas. There can be a lot of different clinical forms, uh, either a solitary papule, you can get destruction of the nasal tissue. 
uh, called the Spundy. I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. Uh, for patients that have been in the, in the endemic areas in the Middle East and, and India and places like that, they can get a thing called post kala azar dermal leishmaniasis. They can look like Hansen's disease. Uh, usually we can see organisms in tissue, and I will show you some examples of that in a minute. Uh, the organism is transmitted, transmitted by the sand fly, Lutsomaya, or phlebotomus. Uh, that's a pretty typical board question, so be prepared for that. Uh, the old world and the new world forms. Uh, talk about the causes of that in a minute. And here you see the fly that actually causes the organism. So they could show you a picture of this and expect you to know that. It's got these little delicate wings. It kind of has this reddish body here, and it's a fairly small uh, fly. So that's what it looks like. And it looks different than like a, uh, a fly that say causes botryomycosis. I'll show you in a minute. And by the way, this, order, this lecture is recorded. If you want to go back and look at any of these slides or, or uh, uh, review it, it's available to you. Uh, but this is the uh, life cycle. The fly takes a blood meal. Uh, it injects the promastigote stage, which has got the little flagella here. Uh, these get uh, phagocytized by macrophages, and then that's what we see in, when we do a biopsy. We see the organisms filling the histiocytes. Uh, these then rupture, they spread throughout the body, the fly comes bites you again, and then picks it up, and then, uh, then the whole thing kind of gets started all over again. So these are some clinical examples. Uh, this one uh, looks like more of a diffuse infiltrated plaque on this lady's face. Uh, these are more verrucous nodules, and these are people that had gotten the uh, disease from Mexico and South and Central America. This is the so-called espundia form that destroys the nasal cavity, long-standing long ulcerations, really a horrible manifestation. And then if you do a biopsy, it generally gives you this very dense diffuse infiltrate, uh, histiocytes and, and plasma cells, and the low magnification, you see all of these holes in here, that's classic or leash mania seen at low magnification. And then when you go to higher magnification, you see these organisms that are sitting inside these histiocytes here, and they tend to cluster at the periphery of the histiocytes, especially in new world leash mania versus old world leash mania. Old world leash mania tends to involve uh, the histiocytes diffusely. The new world type tend to give you the so-called marquee sign, or the, we like to call it the Ferris wheel sign. Uh, so that's more classic for new world leash maniasis, and uh, we call it the Ferris wheel because it looks like the uh, Texas Star Ferris wheel at the State Fair of Texas. So if you ever come to the State Fair, whenever we finish all this uh, uh, quarantining in the, in the world, you can see the Texas Star and ride on the Ferris wheel. Uh, prototheicosis caused by achloric non-pigmented algae of uh, prototheca. And uh, some of the most common are wicker hami and, and zopti. This is the same family as chlorella, which are green algae. And these reproduce asexually by internal septation. So you'll see these little morula cells, these mulberry cells. And there's really three classic forms, uh, the cutaneous form, the electron bursitis form, and the disseminated form. In the skin, we usually see these deep-seated ulcers or cellulitic plaques. And patients usually have some kind of history of trauma. So this person did have an injury at this site, developed this non-healing uh, tumor. And finally, somebody decided to take a biopsy and you can see the inflammation is present pretty deep here. And as you look at it on higher magnification, it's got this non-specific inflammatory reaction, but in higher magnification, it's these little organisms here that are kind of uh, slightly uh, greenish gray. And uh, here you see these, uh, kind of looking at it kind of with a polarization microscopy, they give you these little mulberry morula-like cells, like the morula of, a, uh, of an embryo that's forming. So they look very similar to that. And these actually will stay positive with GMS, even though it's not a fungus. So again, this is an acutaneous uh, algae infecting the skin. It's almost always induced by, by trauma that we see it in culture. Uh, cutaneous myiasis. This is a bot fly infection, and that's says dermatopia hominis. Um, these are boil-like lesions, and the patients will sometimes give you a sensation that the uh, lesions are moving. They've often been to Central or South America. We see patients that uh, go down to Belize for spring break or something like that, and they come back with a, a few of these uh, lesions on their skin, and uh, they have cutaneous myiasis. And what happens is you have this fly, and notice this fly looks completely different 
than the sand fly. So this is a fly that's got a compound eye here. It's got a black body, kind of a fat uh, thorax, if you will. And it, these things lay their eggs on their uh, on their their body here. They come bite you, and they they put them on your skin, and then you scratch, and then you inoculate that in that area where they've bitten. So they don't actually inject these uh, eggs into your skin you do the work for them. So they take a bite, they lay it on your skin, then they fly off and then you scratch it and then you put it inside your skin and the next thing you know, you get one of these kind of lesions. And here you see one of the, uh, the fly larva, the maggot, if you will, that's being extruded from the skin here. And they classically give these little bands of these little black uh, structures here in these, these little rings around the organism. So this is a classic manifestation of of a bot fly, and it's a human bot fly. So there are, there are a lot of different bot flies out there. Some are more uh, adapted to cattle, to other uh, mammals, but this one is adapted to, to man. So you really don't want to have these flying around in, in your area because they actually look for uh, humans. So here you see one of these larvae that's been extracted from the patient, and here it is in the skin. So they took an excisional biopsy of this lesion, and you can see the insect flight muscle here. These are those little black spines at the periphery of the uh, fly. And eventually that's gonna, if that thing were to live, it would form a fully developed fly. And then you see some of the other internal structures of the organism. Uh, Catania sparganosis, pretty rare bird here, but occasionally we'll see this. It's due to a helminthic infection due, pi, due to spirometra, which is a tapeworm. And uh, basically what happens here is that uh, some people in, in some parts of the country will like to put raw snake or frog uh, flesh on an, a wound, and then it actually gives it, and then the organism actually then colonizes the skin. It's seen uh, in the Far East, but we actually seen a few cases in the United States. This was a patient we had a few years ago from Arkansas, and they got an, in, they've been out actually in a brackish water and had an area where the skin was broken down and ended up getting uh, this infection. They didn't have any idea what this was. They thought it was a cyst. Um, this is the life cycle of this organism. And so basically you get the helmet, the helminthic oil over, they get excreted in dog or cat feces and hatch in fresh water. They release the little coracidia, then they get into the, uh, the first intermediate hopes, which is a, a cyclops eats the, the, ar the larva that can send, then get in, accidentally introduced into human beings or the uh, snake or amphibian or fish will eat the little sarcoid larva, and then that can be put on your skin if you take the flesh of this and put it on your skin for one reason or another. And that's what actually happened in this patient that, that I'm gonna show you in a minute. So this is what these things look like if you actually do an IND of them. This is a little tapeworm growing in the skin. This is the little uh, sparganum in situ. And uh, this was a biopsy that we had this a few years ago showing the little tapeworm sitting right here in the middle of the person's uh, reticular dermis. And you can see the outer periphery of the tapeworm here, and then the inner uh, organ, the inner part of the tapeworm here, which is this uh, non-specific or primitive tissue. And basically what this is, it's uh, when this lives in your intestine, it shouldn't be living in your skin. Uh, the the, uh, the body that the person that eats their food and this thing is sitting in your intestine just steals it from you and it just goes inside the tape room instead of going through your small intestine. So people that get this obviously lose a lot of weight and there have been a few uh, uh, models over the years that have actually infested themselves with tapeworm to lose weight, interestingly enough. But here's the cuticle of the, uh, of the worm here and it often will give you these little calcareous bodies, which is pretty classic for that uh, entity. Uh, so looking at ectoparasites, you really need to actually see the organs here to make a diagnosis. Scabies, we all know about this. Uh, normally in a scabetic infection, you have about uh, five to 10 mites per infestation, but if you get someone that's uh, HIV infected, you can see up to a million mites. And uh, would, once you get Norwegian or crusted scabies, it can look like a lot of different things. It can look like atopic dermatitis, psoriasis. Uh, so that's where the diagnosis is often missed. Uh, and the diagnosis is usually made by scraping. Occasionally a biopsy is helpful. Here's the classic uh, intertriginous lesions here. Uh, but this patient had a widespread eruption, HIV positive, and this was also scabies. And this doesn't look like classic scabies. Really not a lot of burrows here. Uh, almost looks like uh, a widespread maybe drug eruption or like an atopic dermatitis. Uh, another example, Norwegian scabies. Here you can't actually see the burrows here in this individual. And uh, this is the female gravid mite. 
a scabies. So you don't see the male mite, you see the female mite. And in order to make the diagnosis, you can see anything. If you see uh, just a little, little piece of the mite, if you see an egg, if you see a curly cue, here's just an egg that was in a scraping. So that's all you need. You don't really actually need to see the mite. Here's one where the mite actually was still left in the, uh, in the tissue here. So when you see that, you can make the diagnosis. The biopsy will usually give you an infiltrate with a lot of the eosinophils in it. And here you see the mite sitting just beneath this little, in this nice little burrow in the very uppermost part of the epidermis. Uh, louse infestations, Theris pubis, the crab louse, or pediculus corporis or capitis, the body or head louse. And this can be the vector for many different conditions, such as typhus. I strongly recommend that you learn all about those, uh, the rickettsial infestations. Uh, the board likes to ask about those questions. And uh, as you all know, the body lice like to live in the clothing. They feed and they go back into their clothing. Um, these can sometimes cause a dermatitis, uh, can look like contact or, or sometimes atopic dermatitis. So this was a dermatitis induced by a louse infestation. Uh, here's the crab louse. And you can see it looks like a little crab. Here is pubis. And uh, this is the head louse. And then the nip of the head louse, and this one's empty, uh, doesn't contain the little organism anymore, so that's just the shell, if you will. And uh, this is the body louse. So the head louse tends to have a, a longer body. The body louse tends to have a shorter, kind of fatter body, if you will. And the crab louse looks like a little crab. Uh, so the last thing we'll talk about are just a few other mite infestations. So there are a lot of other non-human mites that can cause an itchy dermatitis. Again, it's nice if you can find these organisms, uh, sometimes difficult to see. They tend to sort of have, in, instead of looking like scabies, they sort of have a lancet shape or a rocket ship type shape to them. Uh, some of the uh, ones that we see most commonly are Calutelia, uh, Ornithonysis, and, and Dermonysis. So this was a, a lady that had a pet rabbit and was holding it on her chest and got this itchy dermatitis. And I were actually able to find um, from the rabbit Hair. This is the white rabbit's hair, and uh, grabbing onto here was one of the Calutelia mites that was actually causing that lady's uh, infestation. And uh, so here's another example of that patient. And uh, we see similar types of mites with uh, things like chiggers and, and uh, bird mites and others that look kind of similar. So uh, laboratory is an important way to help you make these diagnoses. Uh, Derm paths an important way. Take consider biopsies. You consider other things like PCR and other things like that when uh, hard to get a, an accurate, definitive diagnosis. So uh, again, this is what it looks like in Colorado, where no one's doing any of this now. But uh, <laughs> that's something that uh, hopefully in the future we'll be able to see. So uh, why don't we look at some questions uh, anybody has? I'll, I'll look at the chat room. Um, let's see where I can. We're gonna find the chat room here. Nothing, no chats? Okay, uh, let me open up this. Maybe we'll see if anybody has any questions. Anybody have any, any questions you guys wanna ask? If you wanna unmute your mic and ask a question, you're welcome to do that. Sounds like we got no questions. We're gonna Friday at nine o'clock. We got another talk, and what's the topic gonna be? Cutaneous blistering disorders. So we're gonna talk all about uh, blistering, intraepidermal, subepidermal, you name it. So have an hour-long talk on blisters. You guys be world's experts on that time. Hello, Dr. Papa. Yes. Um, do you mind if we send you questions um, in the course of the review and um, you could probably answer um, some of those questions on Friday before we start um, the next yeah, lecture? Sure. Uh, best way would be, yeah, send that to info at dermpath.com and we will review all of those and have those ready to go. Um, they don't have to be about this lecture. They don't have to be about that lecture. So uh, just any question about derm path that you want to ask, uh, feel free to shoot those over and we'll, uh, we'll address those to the group. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, well, thank you guys for tuning in. And like I said before, this is on the, uh, it's been recorded. So if somebody wants to go back, you want to share it with your friends or whatever, 
um, it's available. All right, thanks a lot. And just put it yeah. out.